Uh, thank you, Arand, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, Namesh, just two minutes yeah. for me. Yeah, sure, sure, go. <laughs> yeah, I just no, want no, to no. say that I got introduced to Ramesh. Uh, we both were on the second tour of uh, Spice Trail, actually, and uh, both had not joined HI then. Uh, Anand was telling me about Ramesh, that one gentleman is there who's designed from IT profession and his whole interest is in uh, history. He's pursuing his own dreams, uh, pursuing his path, and uh, uh, I'm really excited about him. And I'm going to have him as my historian. And Ramesh was there in the second trip. And throughout the trip, Ramesh didn't speak one word. <laughs> I still remember. I was asking Anand, how come somebody who's going to narrate history didn't talk one word throughout the trip? Then he said, no, no, he's not well. He's sick. Then Ramesh told me later, yeah, just like that, he was coughing all the time. So he couldn't talk. Anyway, he wanted to feel the trip, so he came along. So from that time onwards, uh, we sort of, we were preparing um, uh, content for Chola trip. Ramesh was doing the uh, history part of it, Chola history. I was doing money and Selvan, uh, uh, the gist of the story in Tamil and English, and then writing up some introduction to the tour as well as uh, uh, to the story. And uh, Ramesh was doing the Chola part, Chola history part. From that time onwards, uh, we sort of hit it off. So uh, we both uh, really complement each other, and I'm really, really happy to have Ramesh as my as our historian here. So. We clarify our doubts uh, with each other every now and then. Uh, and it's really exciting to work with Ramesh and uh, Anand and uh, Deepa and Priya and uh, Radhika, everybody. It's really, a really, really exciting for me to be working together. And I'll just hand over to uh, Ramesh. Uh, at the end of it, I'll just uh, come back again. Uh, today, please post your questions here on the chat. I'm going to collect them. And then Ramesh is going to answer them only tomorrow because some of the questions may be answered in this next uh, uh, tomorrow's lecture. So just post them. Uh, I'll collect them, I'll consolidate, and I'll ask the questions to Ramesh tomorrow. At the end of the lecture uh, session, Ramesh will answer tomorrow. Over to you, Ramesh. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Paru. Uh, thanks for the good words. And I hope all of uh, you are able to see the screen. Please the screen is my desktop visible. Not yet, Ramesh. Can you share, Ramesh? It's not yet. It's gone. One minute. Uh, just a minute. Anand, I think you have to give me permission because it's uh, the my share is disabled. Okay. Done. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, good evening, friends, and uh, welcome to this session on uh, Chalukya Savatabi. So, for the next uh, two days, we'll be discussing a lot about uh, the Chalukya Savatabi, their origin, their rise, and how from a kingdom uh, they became an empire. One of the, we can say, we can safely say the first empire of South India, and also about uh, one of their greatest kings, uh, Plakesi II. But before we get into the Chalukyas, we need to rewind a few centuries and see the state of South India before the Chalukyas actually came into existence. So, as you all know, <clears throat> as you all know, most parts of, uh, okay, uh, most parts of Central India, particularly the Deccan Plateau and the region lying between Godavari and the Krishna basins, was ruled by a dynasty called Satavahanas. The Satavahanas ruled this dynasty for a very long period, say about 450, kilo, uh, 450 years. And uh, they had their origin from Andhra, then they slowly moved into Madhya Maharashtra and their kingdom was spread across the Krishna Godavari uh, flow. And uh, by the mid of third century, say about 243, 245, the Satavahanas started declining and one fine morning they disappeared from the maps. Once they disappeared, a lot of small kingdoms started appearing across South India. These kingdoms were basically indigenous kingdoms that belonged to that particular locality. And some of them were earlier vassals of feudatories of Satavahana, while the rest of them were new players trying to assert their control over certain regions. During this period, for about 300 years, the history of South India 
days, you can say it was in total darkness as far as information is concerned, not in uh, the real sense, but as far as information is concerned, we do not have much information as to what happened between third century and uh, say about the middle of sixth century when these indigenous kingdoms were ruling across South India. And uh, as I said, not only these kingdoms, but there were, an, uh, there were a couple of new players who were trying to you know, create a domain of their own in South India. So this is how the map of South India looked like uh, during the, uh, we, can say, we can say the last part of uh, 5th century and early part of 6th century. So look at the map. <clears throat> Basically the Karnataka region was uh, trifurcated and the Abhiras were ruling over the central part of Karna Karnataka along with some parts of Telangana. While the Chutus were ruling over the uh, southern part, we cannot say southern part, south central part of Karnataka along with some parts of Andhra Pradesh and the Kadambas had established their kingdom across the Kunkan coast. And Kadambas, remember, were the first indigenous dynasty of South India, or you can say the first indigenous dynasty of Karnataka who patronized Kannada. So when we come to Andhra Pradesh, the Andhra Pradesh coast was actually bifurcated between Vishnukundinis and Ikshwakus. The Vishnukundinis were ruling over the Godavari Krishna Delta between Rajamandri and Vijayawada. And the Ikshwakus were ruling over a part of Guntur district and the southern parts of Andhra Pradesh. There was also a small kingdom called Vengi who were ruling over the northern part of the uh, Godavari, Co Godavari Delta. So this is how the South Indian map look. And when it comes to the south southern part, the Gangas, uh, the, what we call as the Western Gangas or the Gangas of Talakad, had established their kingdom over southern part of Karnataka and some part of northern Tamil Nadu. And then comes the Tamil region. As far as the Tamil region was concerned, the Tamil region was always ruled by three kings, the Cheras, Cholas and the Pandyas. But during this period, the Cheras and the Cholas had virtually disappeared from the map. And the Pandyas were pushed to one corner, to one southern tip of Tamil Nadu, whereas the northern part of Tamil Nadu was ruled by a dynasty called the Pallavas. These Pallavas were new players. They were not either vassals to the uh, Satavahanas or vassals to some other kingdoms. We do not know the exact origin of these Pallava dynasty. Some people say that they came from the north, while others say that they came from the Palnadu region of Andhra Pradesh, which basically is the Guntur and <clears throat> adjoining regions. So that's why they are called Pallavas, because they hailed from Palla, Palnadu. So the Pallavas had moved from the, uh, well, you can say the southern part of Andhra Pradesh, according to scholars, and they had set up their shop with capital at Kanchipuram. And then comes a dynasty, or we cannot call the dynasty, a confederation of uh, chieftains called the Kalabras. These Kalabras are basically mountain tribes who are living in Karnataka and also the Nalamala hills of Andhra Pradesh. And uh, during the course of, uh, you know, uh, when, the, when the churning happened after the Satavahanas, they migrated to south and they occupied large tracts of land that were earlier under the Cholas and the Cheras. Basically, the core part of Tamil Nadu, the central part of Tamil Nadu and the parts of Kerala. So this is how the map looked like at the end of 5th century come 6th century, come and 6th century saw the, uh, what you can say, uh, the rise of the three major kingdoms. The smaller kingdoms started disappearing from the maps. For example, Ikshwakus disappeared and their place was taken over by Vishnu Kundinis and Pallavas. Likewise, Abhiras disappeared and Kadambas had taken over that place. And Chutus disappeared and Gangas had extended their territory to the central part of Karnataka. And likewise, Kalabras were thrown out and Pallavas and Pandyas occupied the Tamil Nadu region. So by 6th century, you can say, by middle of 6th century, the Pallavas and the Pandyas had grown quite powerful. And as far as Karnataka was concerned, the Gangas and Kadambas had consolidated their hold over the Karnataka region. And the Vishnu Kundinis were actually having ruling over a large tract of uh, you know, land over the coastal Andhra Pradesh region. So this is how the landscape uh, of South India looked like in the 6th century. Now, by mid 6th century, it was three major kingdoms who actually started asserting their control. As I said earlier, one was Pandyas, the other was Pallavas, and the third kingdom was the Chalukyas of Vatapi. The Chalukyas of Vatapi appeared from nowhere. Actually, like unlike Pandyas, who were who had about uh, who had a very long history running into BCE, the Chalukyas of Vatapi were quite new. They were new players, even though. We do not know the exact origin. Some people say that they actually were uh, from Gujarat and some say they were indigenous kingdom ruling over a certain or a small dominion in Karnataka as vassals to the Kadambas. 
we do not know the exact uh, origin of the chalukyas of watabi but they actually came into existence by 543 if uh, by 543 the in kingdom of the chatabi chalukyas rose so if you look at the origin as i uh, said jayasimha was credited as the founder of the dynasty he ruled for about 20 years according to the later inscriptions and he ruled an area around the modern day bijapur in karnataka so basically bijapur was closer to the kadamba capital of banavasi or vijayanti so most probably he was a kadamba vassal ruling over a small territory and uh, his he did not have any inscriptions of his own maybe the and the later inscriptions of uh, polakesi and his successors actually credit him as a king of uh, the watabi chalukyas but at that point in time the watabi chalukyas were still a small dominion and maybe uh, vassals to the kadambas he was followed by his son ranaraga again ranaraga was not credited with any military achievements and he as his uh, like his father finds a mention uh, in the later day inscriptions of iholi and mahakuta and we do not know the extent of territory that was ruled by ranaraga so these two uh, people jayasimha and ranaraga were actually uh, were probably uh, in fact the vassals of the kadamba dynasty then comes the first sovereign king of the kadambas of the chalukya sorry and he was polakesi the first polakesi ruled for about 27 years from 540 to 567 maybe he started as a vassal to the kadambas and later set up his own uh, kingdom and uh, he performed ashwamedha yaga or the horse sacrifice or horse sacrifice here doesn't mean killing a horse basically they let loose a horse uh, a royal horse and that will march across various uh, kingdoms and uh, who were opposed as the horse had to fight and gain their territory. So this is more like a, uh, can, uh, this is what was called as a horse sacrifice. And Ashwamedha Yaga was performed by Pulakesi according to his inscription in Vatapi. And uh, he ruled over a territory across, they say, modern Karnataka and the Maharashtra. We do not know the exact extent of the territory. Probably by 543, he fought with Kadambas and encroached upon <coughs> some of their territories around Bijapur and uh, Say southern parts of Maharashtra and uh, set up the kingdom. So Jayasimha was the founder of the dynasty while Polakesi was the founder of the kingdom. He was the first sovereign king of the, uh, uh, you can say the Vatapi Chalukya kingdom. And uh, we do not know exactly the meaning of uh, what Polakesi means according to some uh, you can, uh, scholars. Uh, Puli, they say, is, uh, means tiger and Kesi means head. So they say that he roughly translated to uh, you can say uh, tiger head i'm not sure if uh, puli is called puli in Kannada. it's basically huli if i am right so and another thing is uh, tigers are not known for this as at least kings are uh, lions are known for their uh, uh, mane. so i don't think uh, that uh, meaning of polakesi fits in whereas uh, the other scholars say that it is derived from the sanskrit words pola or pula that means great and Kesin, that means lion. So that fits uh, the description of Polakesi, the great lion, because he was the one who founded the dynasty, uh, founded the sovereign kingdom of the dynasty. <clears throat> and uh, Polakesi, in his inscription, has clearly mentioned that he was the one who built the Watabi fort. He said that he built a fort, a fortified city, and founded Watabi. And this is what you see on the screen is the entrance to the Watabi fort. It's quite uh, beautifully, in fact, uh, designed. It uh, sits between two close uh, hillocks. And it's quite uh, very difficult to approach also uh, from uh, outside. So I think uh, Polakesi was uh, very good in, uh, you know, the finalizing the location of his fort. And uh, thus came the, thus came the Fata Watabi fort, which Polakesi founded. Polakesi was uh, followed by his uh, son, Kirti Varman. And it was Kirti Varman who actually started expanding the territories. We do not know the exact extent of territories that Polakesi one was ruling over. So, given the inscriptions of Kirti Varman, it is Kirti Varman who seems to be the first uh, Patavi Chalukya king who was uh, bent on expanding the territory. And his policy of expansion uh, actually continued for a very long period. And uh, interestingly, the Chipman inscription of Kirti Varman credits him with the founding of Watapi. So most probably, the founder, uh, even though the founder of Watapi was uh, Polakesi, the construction of the fort, which started during the period of Polakesi, probably continued into the period of Kirti Varman. And Kirti Varman who completed the construction of the fort. So maybe he also got credit for the founding, for founding the Watapi uh, fort. 
and uh, Kirti Varman expanded his territories. He had uh, successfully uh, he successfully defeated his neighbors and uh, occupied a large tract of territories across Western Deccan. And he was actually ably assisted by his half brother Mangalesha. Mangalesha had, even though Mangalesha was the step brother, he had a very cordial relationship with uh, Kirti Varman. And between these two brothers, they actually uh, ruled the kingdom in tandem. Whenever Kirti Varman, according to scholars, whenever Kirti Varman, whenever Kirti Varman was on military expeditions, it was Mangalesha who was actually administrating the uh, country and vice versa. When Mangalesha went on military expeditions, Kirti Varman was the one who was taking care of the administration of the country. So basically, these two brothers uh, worked in tandem and uh, Mangalesha actually was a great warrior. In fact, uh, he, he assisted uh, Kirti Varman in many of his uh, battles. Unfortunately, when Kirti Varman uh, died or during the last days of Kirti Varman, he could not make his son Iraya the king because Iraya was quite young. He was only in his teens. So looking at the age, we do not know how old was uh, Kirti Varman's son when uh, Kirti Varman died. But uh, if we calculate based on the regular years of his successors and predecessors, most probably Iraya was around say 13 or 12 or 13 years old when Kirti Varman died in 597. So the mantle of the kingdom passed on to his brother, Mangalesha. The administrating the uh, huge uh, kingdom was not a problem for Mangalesha because he was already doing that during his stepbrother's period. And uh, so he continued uh, administrating the kingdom and also started waging wars against his neighbors. So basically this is uh, how the kingdom of uh, Kirti Varman looked like. So the Kirti Varman's first attack was on the Kadambas. The Kadambas, as I said, were the old masters of the uh, Chalukyas. And the first attack of uh, Kirti Varman was on the Kadambas. Once the Kadambas were subdued, he marched his army to Alupas. Alupas ruled over the South uh, Dakshina Kannada region uh, around Mangalore and also some part of uh, Kasargod district of Kerala. So once the Kadambas and Alupas uh, were defeated, the Gangas fell in line. The Gangas were, there were no mention of any battle with the Gangas. So probably the Gangas accepted the leadership of uh, Kirti Varman. And uh, so the, uh, the extent of the kingdom during Kirti Varman's period stretched to the Kaveri, uh, you can say the flow of Kaveri in southern Karnataka, the, ruled by the Gangas of Talakkar. Again, after that, uh, after uh, subduing the uh, southern territories, Kirti Varman marched his army to the west and he occupied the region, uh, occupied, uh, he defeated the Mauryas of Konkan and occupied their capital Puri. This Puri is identified with Grahapuri or uh, the present day elephant near uh, Mumbai. So a large part of the Deccan Plateau came in, uh, came under the Western uh, Chalukyas and uh, also the southern part of Karnataka. There is also mentioned in Kirti Varman's record about his battle with the Nalas of Bastar in Chhattisgarh, but we do not have much details about what happened during that war and whether Nalas of Bastar actually were, you know, uh, subjugated and the region was occupied. So at the outstretch, it's, uh, the territories of Kirti Varman extended from say, around uh, the southern part of uh, Karnataka to the uh, southern part of uh, Maharashtra and from the Konkan coast to about, uh, say, the Guntur Karnul region of uh, the present day Andhra Pradesh. And as I said, uh, when Kirti Varman died, his son Iraya was white, was, was, was a very small boy. And uh, that uh, made uh, Mangalesha come to the throne. So he succeeded his elder brother, Kirti Varman. And Mangalesha was a well-known face in uh, the Chalukyan territory because he was already ruling the kingdom in tandem with his brother. So he started off from where his brother had left off and he continued the expansion policy of his predecessors. And the most important victories of uh, Mangalesha was against the Kalachuris. These Kalachuris are early Kalachuris, not to be confused with the later Kalachuris of the 10th and 11th century. These Kalachuris were called Haheyas, who basically ruled over some part of Madhya Pradesh and southern part of Gujarat, to the south of the Narmada River. So Kalachuris were, uh, in fact, a, a, a quite a powerful kingdom at that point in time. And Mangalesha conducted two raids over the Kalachuris. His first raid was immediately after coming to the uh, throne. And but that particular uh, invasion was more of a raid and not a not a, no addition to the territories, because uh, even though he invaded that territory somewhere around 600 uh, CE, uh, the inscriptions of the Kalachuri king Buddharaja is found across the uh, southern Gujarat uh, region. So which means that 
there was more of a raid by uh, Mangalesha into the southern part of Gujarat. And he returned with a lot of uh, treasure and booty, but no addition to the territory. And the second invasion probably took place uh, during the end of his uh, reign in 610, where he managed to annex the southern part of Gujarat, called as Latas, the Lata region of uh, southern Gujarat, lying to the south of Narmada near the present day Baruch, and uh, bring them under the control of the Chalukyan dynasty. Now, at the same time, let us see what Iraya was doing. Now, Iraya, who probably was born in about, say, 584 or 585, was only 13 years old when his father died and when his uncle took over the uh, reigns of the uh, Chalukyan kingdom, had grown up and attained the age of eligibility. And uh, if we say that the age of eligibility is 18, so probably by 603 or 604, he must have attained that age of 18 years and he was ready to take over the kingdom from his uncle. But unfortunately, power had gone into the head of Mangalesha, who had a very cordial relationship with uh, his brother Kirtivarman, but refused to concede the throne to his nephew. And, and, and uh, probably the young Pulakesi had nowhere to go. The uh, Iraya uh, was nowhere to go. And uh, in fact, uh, Kirtivarman had three sons. Apart from Iraya was the eldest, and he was followed by another son called Jay Simha. And there was a third guy called Vishnuvardhana. And even though as Raya was only 18 years old, the other two brothers were all maybe were in the mid teens or early teens. So by 603, Raya had come out of age, but still he could not uh, get the uh, throne. And not only Mangalesha prolonged his uh, reign over uh, the Chalukyan territory, he declared his son as the Yuvaraja. He made his son the crown prince, thereby uh, rejecting the uh, claim of uh, Iraya. So this must have made Iraya quite, uh, you can say, over, uh, very upset and it sure made him very upset or angry. So he had to uh, go into exile. He walked out of the court of uh, Mangalesha, his uncle, and went into exile. And at the same time, Mangalesha continued his uh, battles and there was a rebellion by uh, the governor of Revati Dipa. Revati Dipa is nothing but the modern day Goa, which was subjugated by uh, Kirti Verman earlier. This Revati Dipa is a very key port. So the Kadambas, uh, because the Kadambas were basically a plateau kingdom, they always wanted a port on the west coast. And the port of Revati Dipa really meant a lot to them. So uh, the rebellion by the uh, governor of Revati Dipa was uh, you know, uh, suppressed. And the Revati Dipa and adjoining parts of Kadambas were firmly brought under the control of Mangalesha. And Mangalesha was basically a Vaishnavite, he followed Vaishnavism, and he built the cave, built, uh, the, built cave number three uh, in Vata, be considered to be the largest of all the caves, which was dedicated to Lord Vishnu. And uh, the inscription in that uh, cave talks very highly about uh, his brother, Kirti Varman. So it seems that he had a lot of respects for his brother, but he did not want to concede power to his nephew. So uh, he refused to give up uh, the throne when Pulakesi became an adult. So where did Pulakesi go? Pulakesi, as I said, was around 18 years old or probably a little uh, more than that. And Pulakesi had, did not have anywhere to go. So most probably, according to the scholars, he took refuge in the Nalas, uh, in the territory of Banas. These Banas were, uh, you can say, a local uh, chieftains who were ruling over uh, the kingdom of, or ruling over the southern part, or south, so you can say southeast part of Karnataka and northern part of Tamil Nadu, which actually had borders with the Pallava territory. So he took refuge in the, somewhere in the Bana territory. Most probably people say that in and around Kolar, somewhere around Kolar he took refuge. And uh, for the next few years, we do not hear anything about uh, Iraya or his brother Jayasimha. In our probability, Jayasimha, the younger brother, followed his uh, uh, elder brother into exile. We do not have any information about uh, where Vishnu Vardhana went. So, uh, Pulakeshi uh, or Iraya took refuge in the uh, southern uh, part of, uh, or to, uh, to somewhere to the south of uh, Watabi or the Chalukyan territory. <laughs> this is basically <clears throat> the territories uh, under Mangalesha. If you look at uh, the territories, now, the territories were more or less the same uh, under uh, as under Kirti Varma, except that the northern, uh, the southern part of Gujarat had come under the uh, control of the Chalukyan kingdom. So there was not a large, uh, much addition to the territory, but there was uh, some addition to the earlier territory uh, 
which was basically the second plateau. Now they have moved moved further up, up to the Narmada Valley of uh, or the southern uh, to the south of Narmada uh, in Gujarat. So now we come to the first uh, we can say the first emperor of South India, Pulakesi the second. As I said, uh, uh, Kirti son Eraya took refuge in the Bana country. We do not know for how long he was in Bana country and what he was doing. Probably he entered Bana country sometime around 605 or 606. And for the next four years or five years, he was basically building a kingdom. Uh, build, not building a kingdom, but building an army to take over his uh, uncle. So he was heavily assisted by his uh, younger son, uh, younger brother, uh, Jayasimha. And uh, so between 605 or 604, 605 to 609, 610, we do not hear much about uh, Iraya. So in 610, uh, armed with uh, a group of loyalists and supported by his uh, younger brother, Jaisimha, Pulakesi entered the Chalukyan territory. By now, Mangalesha had become old and we do not know, uh, we do not hear much about his son who he had already made him uh, the crown prince. So by 609, 610, Eraya uh, entered the Chalukyan territory from the south, most probably through Andhra Pradesh, the present day Andhra Pradesh. And uh, Mangalesha, the aging Mangalesha, then had to march or advance to the southern part of his kingdom to take on his living. And a battle took place somewhere around the present day Anantapur, in which Mangalesha was defeated and also killed. So the Igola inscription of uh, Pulakesi gives a very vivid, uh, uh, you know, detail of how this battle took place. Now we do not have the location of the uh, battle as such, but it says that the Mangalesha became very envious of Pulakesi because he was a very favorite uh, son. He became a very favorite son of Goddess Lakshmi, uh, the goddess of fortune, and he tried to suppress him. And uh, uh, Pulakesi or Iraya had to use uh, the gifts of good counsel and energy to throw out Mangalesha and finally Mangalesha lost not only his uh, kingdom but also his life. So this is the description that is given in the Ayola inscription of uh, Pulakesi and Pulake and the Araya advanced after defeating Mangalesha advanced into the Chalukyan territory and went to Pattarakal where he crowned himself the king of the Bar Vatabi, uh, Vatabi Chalukyan kingdom and uh, even though Vatabi was the capital of uh, the Chalukyan kingdom Patadakal was where the coronation of the kings took place, very similar to what we see in uh, the Chola territory where the capital was Tanjavur, whereas the coronation always used to take place in Padayare, the residential capital of the Chola. Similarly, Patadakal was where the coronation of the Vatavi Chalukya kings took place and Eraya took the, uh, uh, went to uh, Patadakal, crowned himself the king of the Vatavi Chalukyan territory and assumed the title Pulakesi. So Pulakesi was his grandfather's title, uh, first name, and he has assumed that. So by 610, probably 610 or 611, Pulakesi had entered Vatapi. The Hyderabad inscription of uh, Pulakesi da is dated the third regnal year, and that is actually 613. So most probably uh, Pulakesi started his reign in some uh, sometime around 610 or 611. Now that was the easiest part for Pulakesi. He killed his uncle, he entered uh, Vatapi, he crowned himself the king, he became the king. But he had troubles right from the day he took over. Most of the vessels, including the Kadambas and Alupas, were basically, uh, you can say, were owed their allegiance to his uncle Mangalesha. So they refused totally to accept the leadership of Pulakesi. So the southern part started slipping out of Pulakesi's hands, including the Gangas of Talakar because Gangas basically had marital relationship with the Kadambas and they usually go with the Kadambas. So the Kadambas, Alupas in uh, South and the Gangas, they were all actually uh, together and they refused uh, to accept the leadership of Pulakesi the first, uh, second. And not only that, powerful neighbors, powerful kingdoms started cropping up around the Chalukyan territory. For example, the Pallavas. Mahendra Pallava took over uh, the throne of uh, the Pallava kingdom in 600 CV, a good 10 years before Pulakesi came to power. And he started expanding his kingdom, and it was a rapid expansion, actually. He uh, expanded his kingdom to the north and northwest of Tamil Nadu and also into the south uh, coast of Andhra Pradesh. And his kingdom extended to the Kaveri River in the south, uh, in the central part of Tamil Nadu in the south. 
So with powerful uh, enemies appearing all over, and also the vassals uh, refused to listen or to accept the leadership of Polakesi, it was a tough job for a boy. Now, uh, if you look at the age of Polakesi at, this, at that point in time, he was probably in his early 20s or mid 20s, maybe around 24, 25 years old, after spending considerable amount of time in the uh, Bana territory in exile. So, a small, a small boy who has uh, just come to the throne did not have any uh, experience whatsoever in ruling a kingdom because he was never a crown prince. He was very young or very a very small boy when his father died, and his uncle refused to uh, give him any responsibility. So it was a very tough, uh, you can say, probation, probation for uh, Polakesi. And but to be fair to Polakesi, he was up to the task. So he started off uh, building his kingdom right from the scratch, right from the scratch. In fact, he did not, it, by 609, when he was in exile, he did not even have a cent of land to rule. And by 610, he managed to occupy Watapi, but around Watapi, he has troubles almost everywhere. <clears throat> So let us see how uh, uh, Polakesi warded off all these troubles to become an emperor. So we can divide Polakesi's life into three distinct phases. The first phase was basically consolidation, where he basically where he basically concentrated on bringing uh, the vassals who did not uh, accept his leadership uh, under his control. And the second phase was basically an expansion phase, where he expanded his territory to uh, the two new uh, new territories which his, uh, his predecessors did not even venture into and then came and during this phase came the most important battle with Ashwardhana and uh, we will see uh, the details of what caused the battle and what was the date of the battle and uh, what was the outcome of the battle based on various artifacts and phase three was his battles with the Pallavas he had two battles with the Pallavas with mixed results so we can uh, divide Apollo Casey's life into actually the three, actually three parts or three phases. So the first phase was basically a consolidation phase for Apollo Casey. As I said, he was pretty new to the administration. He did not have any experience whatsoever, except for a battle with uh, his own uncle. He was not a, he was not exposed to any uh, major uh, battles with his, with other kingdoms. So phase one between 610 to 616, 617 was basically a phase where Pulakesi was, you know, struggling to establish his control over his parental, or you can say, uh, paternal territory, the territory which was owned by his parents or by his predecessors, uh, over which he did not have uh, much, or for that matter, did not have any control over uh, those regions. And... Uh, <clears throat> The first uh, attack on the Chalikyan territory came from the Rashtrakutas. The Rashtrakutas were ruling a small uh, territory who were earlier vassals to the Watavi Chalukyas, and Rashtrakutas uh, actually owed their allegiance to Mangadesha, like his uh, uncle. So Rashtrakutas, sensing uh, the dilemma of Pulakesi, where he had to control the uh, you know uprising across his territories, for, were the first to invade. They crossed River Bhima from the north of Watavi. They crossed over Bhima from Maharashtra into the northern territory of the core Chalukyan territory. Actually, they were led by two people, Apaika and Govinda. We do not know if there are if they were brothers or if they were just chieftains or uh, or father and son duo. But these two actually were the first to invade the Chalukyan territory. This happened very early uh, in uh, Pulakesi's reign, say probably around 610 when Pulakesi took over. And this guy, Polakesi, was very shrewd. What he did was, he went and talked to Appa, uh, Govinda separately, one of the two who invaded the kingdom. He made Govinda an ally. He drove a wedge between the two, Apaika and Govinda, and used Govinda to defeat Apaika. So Apaika was probably defeated and killed. And the Rashtrakuta's uh, territory was handed over to Govinda as a vassal to uh, Polakesi. So even at a very young age, say around 20, 25, uh, 25 or 26 years old, this guy had that uh, guts to take on the enemies face to face. So he did not run away from the battlefield. Instead, he was able to drive a wedge between his enemies and then conquer. So it's more like a divide and rule. Then he went on to occupy the other territories. His first attack was uh, after the Rashtrakutas, his first attack was on the Kadambas. The Kadambas had rebelled and declared themselves independent. 
and Pulakesi just marched into the capital, defeated them, and occupied Vijayanti, or the present day Banavasi, which was the capital. And then from there, he marched his way to Alupas. We do not know if Alupas were uh, actually uh, defeated in a battle because Alupas were under the Chalukyas uh, mm -hmm. even during Mangalesha's period and even for uh, Kim Kithivarman's Kithi period. Probably oh, yeah. only a part of the Alupa territory was under the Chalukyas or the Alupas rebelled yeah. against the Pulakesi and yeah. sided yeah. with yeah. the Kadabas. We do not know exactly what happened, yeah. but Alupas were subdued. And Pulakesi did a very intelligent thing here. When Alupas were subdued and subjugated, he handed over the Kadamba territory to Alupas and asked them to rule. He split the Kadamba territory into two, made them into two mandalas or two provinces. One he gave to a dynasty called Sendrakas and the other to the Alupas, thereby completely removing uh, Kadambas from the picture because Kadambas were pretty strong and they were uh, older, ma the old masters of the uh, Chalukyas. So he did not want any. Uh, what okay, importance to be given to the Kadamba. So to ensure that Kadamba territory was split into two, the northern part was given to uh, the central caste who were actually vassals to Plekesi and the southern part to the Alupas. So with a larger territory to rule, the Alupas were quite contented, they fell in line. And with the defeat of Kadambas and Alupas, Gangas gave in. Gangas had another problem uh, and uh, we'll just discuss that a little later. And uh, so they just gave in without a fight. And the Ganga king, uh, Durvinita, gave his daughter in marriage to Pulakesi, according to the Nagara inscription. Now, there is a bit of confusion over the reigning uh, regnal years of uh, the Ganga Durvi, uh, Durvinita. Most, uh, according to some scholars, they ruled between 529 and 579. And most probably that uh, may not be the case because when he died in 579, Pulakesi was not even born. So he would not have given his daughter in marriage. So most, and according to some other, uh, uh, scholars, he ruled till 610, and uh, he was the one actually who helped, <clears throat> along with uh, Pulakesi's brother Jaisima, who helped uh, Pulakesi in regaining control over the uh, earlier uh, vassals. So, whatever may be the case, we do not know what uh, exactly the regnal years of Durvinta were. And uh, taking uh, uh, into cognizance the uh, argument of uh, the scholars who say that he ruled up to 610. And Durvinita gave his uh, daughter in marriage to Pulakesi. So the Gangas, who earlier had marital relationship with the Kadambas, now started having relationship, marital relationship with the Chalukyas. And with the southern part and the southwest part completely under his control, now Pulake, Pulakesi set his eyes on the northern part. Now he marched his army into the southern part of uh, Gujarat, the Lata Kingdom or Lata region which was already under Magalesa. So all he had to do is just ensure that uh, they fall in line. And we do not know if there, is a, uh, if there was a battle that took place at uh, in uh, southern Gujarat, because uh, his eyehole inscription just says that the Latas, Gujaras, and the Malwas just fell in line, uh, fell in line with the Chalukyas. So maybe there was no battle. Now, by 616 or 615, you can say, uh, Pulakesi's reign uh, had really extended into new, uh, into the old Chalukyan territories, starting from the Gangas in the south to the Latas in the north and northwest, to the south of Narmada. Now comes the battle with Harshavardhana. Now, this is a very important, uh, okay, you can say a battle uh, in which uh, Harshavardhana, in which Pulakesi uh, participated. And uh, we have a few questions. Now, before we get into the details of this battle, let us see what was happening on that part of the region. As you, as you see in the map, the Malwa region of Madhya Pradesh was ruled by the Malwas. And the northern part of Gujarat and some parts of Rajasthan, just beyond uh, Narmada, was ruled by the Gujaras. The Gujaras and Malwas were actually uh, allies. They had a very cordial uh, relationship. And beyond Vindhyas, it was the uh, Vardhana Empire. The Vardhana Empire was quite huge. It extended, say, from uh, almost uh, to the, uh, uh, we can say, the east of Sindh to Kamrupa, there's a present day Assam, and it was a huge empire that was ruled by a king called Prabhakara Varma. Prabhakara Varma had two sons, Rajyavardhana and Harshavardhana, and one daughter, Rajeshri. And uh, what happened was after the death of Prabhakar Varma, the elders and Rajyavardhana took over. And Rajyavardhana 
in, in the process of expanding his kingdom actually encroached upon the northern parts of Malwa, which means that he entered the Malwa territory and he occupied uh, some of the regions that belong to the Malwas just across the Narmada. So probably this uh, brought him in conflict with uh, Malwas who were heavily supported by the Gujaras. So one fine morning, Rajyavardhana of the Vardhana dynasty was assassinated. He was killed. And uh, there is no actually, uh, we do not have much details as to how he was killed, even though he is said to be killed, he was said to be killed by the Gauda king of Shashanka, who was who ruled over the Gauda kingdom of West Bengal and who was a close ally of the Malawa king. So we do not, uh, let us not get into those details. And uh, Rajyavardhana was assassinated and the needle of suspicion pointed to the Malawa king Devadatta. So once uh, the Vardhana king uh, Rajyavardhana was assassinated, his younger brother Harshavardhana took over. And around the same time, there was another assassination in the Vardhana family. Uh, Harshavardhana's sister, Rajasri's husband, uh, Harshavardhana's brother-in-law, Grahavarma was also killed. Grahavarma was ruling one part or one dominion of the Vardhana, dynasty, Vardhana kingdom and he was also assassinated. And this probably must have enraged Harshavardhana because there were two assassinations and in both cases, the uh, needle of suspicion pointed to Devadatta, the Malava king, and he was supported by the Gurjara king, Dadda too. So probably Harshavardhana thought that uh, he has to uh, take revenge or avenge the assassination of his brother and brother-in-law on one hand. The other, uh, uh, according to some scholars, maybe Harshavardhana, also an imperial king who was bent on expanding his territories, wanted to uh, you know, uh, subdue Malavas and Kujras and then moved down south to the Deccan Plateau where Pulakesi was fighting with the Vasus to establish control over his kingdom. So he wanted to take advantage of Pulakesi's uh, 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 predicament and uh, uh, troubles with uh, the Vasus, okay, probably in the early period, uh, 610 to 615, so the period when he was uh, establishing his control over his southern territories. And uh, so Ashwatthana was, you know, was intended to uh, move or uh, uh, planning to move into the Deccan Plateau across the Vindhyas. On the other hand, Pulakesi having established his control over Lata Chalukya, probably <clears throat> accepted the submission of Malavas and Gujarat. These two, the Gujarat, uh, Gujaras and Malavas probably thought that maybe it's better to uh, submit themselves to Pulakesi because he was quite powerful at that point in time and was quite young and uh, so that they can ward off the threat of uh, Harshavardhana and uh, you know uh, live a peaceful life. So the Gurjaras and Malavas actually submitted to Pulakesin and Pulakesin now had entered into a direct con conflict with the Vardhanas. So uh, the Vardhanas were ruling over the northern part of uh, to the north of uh, you can say Narmada, north of Vindhyas and Pulakesi has now extended his territory or at least had made the Malwa king uh, submit to him and uh, extended his influence, if not the territory, to the south of Narmada. Now that must have brought both these uh, kingdoms into conflict, the kingdom of Vardhanas and the growing kingdom of Pulakesi. So this according to, <clears throat> this according to uh, scholars could be the reason, it could be Harshana's, uh, Harshavardhana's imperial designs or it could be, uh, you know, Polakesin's imperial design to stretch his, uh, extend his kingdom across uh, Narmada, or uh, maybe the Gurjaras and the uh, Malavas played a little part by submitting themselves to Polakesin, uh, thereby uh, making Harshavardhana angry because Polakesin gave uh, refuge to, to these two kings who he wanted to uh, uh, take revenge on. So probably there were a combination of reasons. We do not know what exactly was the reason behind the battle between Harshavardhana and Pulakesin. But all these uh, reasons or all these causes brought Harshavardhana in direct conflict with uh, Pulakesin, who was actually uh, extending his kingdom far and wide. Now, uh, now next comes the date of the battle. We do not know exactly when the battle took place. The Hyderabad, Hyderabad inscription dated the third regnal year of Prakesi has a mention to this battle. So some section of scholars, including Nilakanta Shastri and others, they say, K.V. Ramesh and Nilakanta Shastri, they say that this battle could have happened during the early days of uh, Prakesi's reign, say probably between 612 and 613. However, later there was another inscription that was found uh, in Bijapur, uh, which is called the Bijapur Mumbai inscription, 
and uh, that inscription particular uh, that inscription is dated 619 and th that gives a, a lot of details about the battle with Arshavardhana. So the later day historians probably thought that the battle took place sometime around that period in 618, uh, sometime in 618, probably they dated to 618 November to 619 uh, February, so the winter of uh, 618. Uh, so we do not have uh, because uh, we do not have uh, any confirmation on that on the date because the Satara inscription of Vishnuvardhana, Pulakesi's uh, uh, second brother, the youngest of the three, uh, which is dated 618, does not mention uh, the battle of uh, Pulakesi with uh, Harshavardhana. So probably they thought that it could have happened after that inscription was set up, say probably in 618 or 19. So we do not have the exact uh, date. It could be. Uh, so we can safely assume that it happened sometime between 613 and 618. So in a period of five years, when Pulakesi was expanding his empire to the uh, north of uh, to the north of uh, the Deccan Plateau. So now uh, let us see the uh, outcome of the battle. Very interestingly, only Pulakesi's inscriptions talk about this battle. The Harshavardhana's uh, records are totally silent about uh, the battle, particularly Harshavardhana's court poet Bana, who wrote the Harsha Charitra. Uh, doesn't mention anything about uh, this battle, but there are independent sources that confirm that one such battle had happened. First, let us see what Pulakesi says about this uh, particular battle with Harshavardhana. His Ihole inscription mentions this battle. It says that uh, uh, Pulakesi actually led his army across the Vindhyas and uh, he has clearly mentioned that the Harshas, that Harsha's army melted away in fear and actually and retreated after their elephants were slain and filled. So probably uh, Harshavardhana retreated. Uh, so it gives, an, uh, it gives a, an impression that Harshavardhana actually retreated, which means that Harshavardhana must have progressed beyond Narmada or beyond Vindhyas, where he would have met Pulakesi. And uh, Pulakesi also uh, adds in that, uh, you know, prasasti or inscription, that he did not uh, deploy his elephant uh, corps in this army, uh, in this battle, uh, because uh, he says in a very poetic way that his elephants were quite huge and bulk, that they rivaled uh, the mountains of uh, Vindhya. So he did not want uh, uh, the Vindhyas to be shaken by his elephants, so he did not deploy. So uh, historians basically say that uh, uh, this imply, this gives an, it gives an impression that Ashwarthana did not deploy his elephants and basically deployed only the infantry and cavalry. And uh, going by the first, uh, uh, you know, the uh, description where he says that he stopped Ashavardhana and made him retreat. Uh, scholars say that probably Ashavardhana wanted to cross India into the southern part of Narmada, and uh, Pulakesi's army, who are guarding the mountain passes with infantry and cavalry, probably stopped him from doing that. But there are other sections of uh, scholars who believe that actually a battle that took place on the banks of Narmada and Harsha had to make a hasty retreat. Whatever may be the case, the uh, scholars believe that uh, there was a battle or at least uh, there was uh, some kind of engagement between Palakesi and Harshavardhana and Harshavardhana's, uh, uh, you know, say advance into the uh, Deccan Plateau was uh, successfully stopped by Palakesi. Now, uh, we will, uh, and these are the inscriptions of Palakesi. So let us see what, what the, uh, inscriptions of uh, what you can say the uh, independent inscriptions say. Uh, as you know, Yuan Zhuang, the Chinese traveler, Yuan Zhuang visited uh, Pulakesi's court in 641. And in this uh, travelogue, uh, this Chinese traveler has made it very clear that Srila Ditya, another name of Ashwavardhana, had conquered east and west and he tried to advance into south, uh, the territory of Mahalocha, and, uh, which, uh, which scholars identify as Maharashtra. And uh, but and summoned some of his uh, best commanders and uh, army. However, the people of Mahalocha uh, did not accept uh, his uh, suzerainty, and uh, he could not subjugate them. So there is an independent view of uh, what happened in that battle. And uh, going by uh, the description of Wan Zhang, we now we, it's very clear that it was Ashwadhana who was trying to cross over into the Chaluk, uh, Chalukyan territory or into the Deccan Plateau, and was effectively stopped by Pulakesi. Rashtrakutas, who later replaced uh, uh, Chalukyas, uh, uh, actually uh, had proudly uh, 
described themselves as the one who defeated the dynasty who defeated Harshavardhana. So they defeated Chalukyas, who basically defeated Harshavardhana. So these are some of the independent, uh, you know, uh, you can say description of what happened. But anyway, uh, at the end of the day, there seemed to be a truce between uh, Harshavardhana and Pulakesi. The, both the kings seem to have entered into a, some sort of agreement and Narmada became the de facto boundary uh, Narmada became the de facto boundary between these two kingdoms. It's, it's mentioned that uh, Narmada became the de facto boundary of the kingdom of the Lord of the North and the kingdom of the Lord of the South, probably uh, referring to Harshavardhana and uh, Pulakesi respectively. So this was the first phase of Pulakesi. By 616, uh, Pulakesi had established his control over, over the south and southwest part of uh, uh, Karnataka, the western part, the western uh, part of the Deccan Plateau, and also had ventured into uh, into the southern, you can say, trans uh, trans Narmada region of uh, Gujaras and Marwas, right up to uh, uh, right to the Vindhyas. So the first six years, now let us see how old was Pulakesi. So even if we say that he was around 25 years or 24 years when he took over, by 30 years he had made, uh, he had took control of the entire Western Deccan Plateau. And uh, actually uh, when uh, we talk about the invasion of uh, uh, Harshavardhana, with the date of uh, uh, battle between Harshavardhana and uh, Pulakesi, Huan Zhuang uh, makes a very interesting uh, you know, note, he says that Harshavardhana waged all his wars in the first six years of his reign. And then, uh, not Harshavardhana, sorry, Pulakesi waged all uh, his battles, all his wars in the first six years of his reign. And then for the next 30 years, he ruled in peace. So going by that, the battle could have taken place anywhere between 612 and 618. And uh, we do not have to take sides uh, with the scholars. We'll just say that it happened sometime between 613 and 618. And uh, Polakesi was able to ex uh, now, uh, extend his territory right up to the southern banks of Karmada. So having consolidated his uh, reign or uh, his hold over the old territories which his, which his forefathers or which his ancestors had won, Polakesi then turned his attention to expanding his territories. Now comes the second phase of his life. So by 616, yes, well, everything is done and tested. Yeah. The Western, uh, the Western Deccan Plateau has become part of the established, has established complete control uh, over the Western Deccan Plateau, parts of uh, Southern Karnataka, parts of uh, Gujarat, and parts of Madhya Pradesh. Yeah. And 616, between 616 and 617, he started the expansion. Before going on, uh, before going on expanding his territory, in 616 he made his uh, younger brother Vishnuvardhana as the crown prince or the one who will take care of the administration when he and his uh, next brother Jay Simba were on military expeditions. So Vishnuvardhana was handed over the reins of uh, administration while uh, Purakesi along with his uh, younger brother, very trusted younger brother Jay Simba, uh, who remained with Purakesi in, uh, you know, uh, during all times in thick and thin and uh, started expanding his territory. So if we look at this, starting from Watabi, his first attack was on the Kosala, on the Kosala region. Kosala is also called as Dakshin Kosala. It was ruled by the Panduvanshi kings. And uh, I think uh, the king was ruling at that point in time was, uh, was by name Balarjuna, if I remember right. So he invaded the Kosala territory. The Kosala territory is basically the western parts of Orissa, the present day Odisha. Uh, you can say the districts of uh, uh, Balangir, Sonepur, uh, Sundargarh, and Sambalpur, and they are joining eastern parts of uh, Chhattisgarh, the regions of uh, Rajnandgaon, Durga, uh, Durg, and uh, uh, Raipur. So this uh, Dakshin Kosala kingdom uh, was invaded by Pulakesi in 600, somewhere around 616-17, and uh, the Kosalas actually gave in without a fight. In fact, they just accepted uh, Pulakesi's uh, leadership without a fight. And from there, he marched his way to uh, Kalinga. Kalinga is basically the kingdom uh, that spread across the southern part of uh, Odisha coast and the northern part of Andhra coast, across uh, Shikakulam, Vijayanagaram, and Vishakapatam districts of uh, Andhra Pradesh and uh, 
ganjam parleka mundi at the 6th of uh, odisha again there was no battle uh, with the kalinga and the kalingas they just submitted to uh, polakesin so from there polakesin marched into the kingdom of vengi vengi was a very small kingdom vengi finds a reference in uh, samudra gupta's uh, arahabad inscription so vengi was a very small kingdom to the north of uh, you can say uh, godavari northern banks of godavari say about uh, a few uh, about 50 60 kilometers from rajamandri and uh, uh, polakesi actually attacked the vengi kingdom the capital was uh, pishtapura or the present day pithapuram near uh, rajamandri near kakinada so they were subdued and uh, vengi became part of the chalukyan territory and from there he marched his uh, way to vishnukundini's territory vishnukundini is as i said ruled over a large territory between Godavari and the Krishna Delta, starting from the southern banks of Godavari, say around Rajamandri, to southern banks, say to the northern uh, part of uh, northern part of Kunto uh, district. So there was a there was a large territory and also some interior areas. And uh, at that point in time, Vishnukundini uh, region was ruled by a person called Indravarma. So there was a battle, and uh, that took place on the banks of Kolleru, uh, somewhere between Vijayawada and uh, Yeluru uh, in the Sudavari district. And Polakesi's uh, Ilohol inscription says that uh, the waters of Lake Kolleru became red with the blood. So Vishnu Kundaris were subdued, and after that, Polakesi probably sometime around 618 and 19 made his way back to Watapi. Now, just imagine Polakesi, Polakesi's reach. Yes. A kingdom, or you can call it an empire, that stretched from Narmada in the north and northwest to Kaveri in southern Karnataka, and from the uh, western coast of Konkan and Goa to the eastern coast of Andhra Pradesh. It was a huge empire. It was, uh, and remember, he built this empire all by himself, starting from the scratch. As I keep saying, he did not even have a cent of land in 609 when he was in exile, and between 609 and 619. In just 10 years, with the help of his brother and with the help of a huge army, he not only subjugated or suppressed his uh, vassals who, were, uh, uh, who rebelled against him, he conquered new territories and had the guts to fight a person of uh, Harshavardhana's stature and uh, literally stopping him from crossing into the Deccan Plateau and also uh, expanded his territories beyond what uh, his forefathers had done. He ventured into uh, one of the parts of Chhattisgarh, Varissa, and uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh. And the whole of Deccan Plateau had by 2019 had come under Polakesi's reign. So this uh, actually uh, completed phase two of Polakesi's life. Little again. And now comes his battle with Pallavas. Now, as I keep, as I said earlier, Pallavas and Ramhendra Pallava, were expanding rapidly. Uh, they had occupied uh, almost the whole of Western uh, Tamil Nadu, called as the Kongu country or Kongu Nadu, and they had ventured into the eastern uh, coast of Andhra Pradesh, the southern part earlier occupied by the Chwakus, and they they were rapidly expanding. But were they really a threat to the Pallavas, threat to the Chalukyas? And if you look at uh, the events that happened during Mahendra Pallava's early part, uh, early uh, part of his reign, Mahendra Pallava's reign, and also Pulakesi's reign, probably Pallavas were never a direct threat to the Chalukyas because the Pallava territory was lying down almost 700 kilometers away from the core Chalukyan territory, and they had the Gangas in the middle, and. Uh, So they had the Gangas in the middle, actually, to, uh, as a buffer zone, and Watabi uh, was quite far away from Kanchipuram. So probably uh, Pallavas uh, were not a direct threat and, uh, uh, to the Chalukyas, and, in, and if Mahendra Varma had wanted to occupy or attack the Pallava to the, the Chalukya territory, he could have done that very easily. Uh, during the earlier part of his uh, reign, because Mahendra Pallava occupied the throne, the Pallava throne, in 600, a good 10 years before Polakesi came to power. So he had 10 years. He could have invaded uh, the uh, Chalukyan territory during the rule uh, during the rule of uh, Mangalesha, and also he could have taken advantage of uh, 
the uh, civil war between Polakesi and Mangalesha in somewhere sometime between uh, uh, 609 and 610, and you would have occupied a large uh, part of Chalukyan territory. And Mahendra Pallava did not do that. So probably uh, Mahendra Pallava was not interested in attacking or occupying the Chalukyan territory. Now comes the second question: Did Ganga play a part in the Pallava Chalukyan uh, rivalry? Probably yes. Because the Gangas were located very close to the Pallava territory and they had marital relationship with the Chalukyas. Durvinsa had given his daughter in marriage to Polakesi according to the Nagara inscription. Now, with the exp rapid expansion of uh, the Pallava territory, Mahendra Pallava probably occupied some part of Kongunadu, uh, the western, north and north, uh, northwestern, north and western parts of Tamil Nadu, which was earlier under the Gangas thereby depriving Gangas of their southern territory. So probably the Gangas thought or Gangas perceived uh, Pulakesi, uh, sorry, Mahendra Varman as a threat to their kingdom. And that probably could have influenced uh, Pulakesi because Durvinita, Ganga Durvinita helped him, uh, helped uh, Pulakesi in uh, restoring the old glory of uh, his uh, father, of his uh, old kingdom. So probably, Pulakesi was obliged uh, to help Durvinita in suppressing the Pallavas so that the uh, Gangas take uh, control of the older territories, which they had lost to Pallavas. And then was there a Pallava, Kadamba Pallava Vishnu Kundini's confederation? Now, this is a very interesting question. Okay. If you look at the uh, map, uh, there was a possibility, there was not uh, actually, there, it was not on paper, but maybe Pulakesi perceived a confederation of uh, Kadambas in the west, Pallavas in the south, and Vishnu uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the east. Uh, a confederation of these kingdoms, a threat to his uh, kingdom. Why so? Because as we had seen earlier, Pallavas uh, owe their origin, according to some scholars, owe their origin, to the uh, Palanadu region of Andhra Pradesh that was very close to the Vishnu Kundanis. And on the other hand, uh, Pallavas had very close ties with Kadambas ever since the first king of Kadamba dynasty. In fact, the founder of Kadamba dynasty was called Mayura Sarman or Mayura Varman had his education in Kanchipuram. So he, when, uh, when uh, the Kadamba king had his education or Kadamba prince at that point in time, had his education in Kanjipuram, he would have got very uh, pretty uh, a very friendly tie with the Pallavas. And uh, this is confirmed by the presence of the Pallava royal family in the coronation of Mayura Varman as the king of the Kadamba dynasty. It uh, in all likelihood the, the then crown prince Kumar Vishnu of uh, Pallava was present in the uh, coronation ceremony of uh, the Kadamba king. So probably the Kadambas and the Pallavas were uh, or not probably. Obviously, the Kadambas and Pallavas were very close uh, allies, and the Pallavas had a social, cultural, and even marital relationship with Vishnu Kundanis. And maybe Mahendra Pallava had some sort of uh, soft corner uh, with Vishnu Kundanis, and they ent entered into some kind of alliance. Because if you look at the expansion of uh, the Pallava territory into southern Andhra Pradesh, Mahendra Pallava expanded his territory right to the southern part of Gujarat and then stopped. The northern part of Gujarat belongs to the, belong to the Vishnu Kundanis. So probably he respected Vishnu Kundanis, gone to, got into an alliance with them. Nothing is there on paper, but the events, uh, if you look at the events uh, in the Chalukya and the Pallava kingdom, that uh, leads us to believe that Pulakesi probably perceived a Kadamba Pallava Vishnu Kundini confederation a threat. And Pallava strategically located. Uh, between the Kadambas and the Vishnu Kundanis, and the, the most powerful of the three uh, kingdoms uh, could play uh, a role or could uh, just uh, enter or attack their territory. So there, there is a combination of reasons uh, as to why uh, Pulakesi chose to attack the uh, Pallava kingdom. So by 621, he actually marched a large army into the Pallava territory. Pulakesi led an army and uh, marched into the Pallava territory and he came as close as to Panjipuram. But unfortunately, going by the records of Pulakesi, 
and also by the records uh, by the record of pallavas uh, it is uh, obvious that despite reaching uh, the gates of kanchipuram the chalukyas were not able to break into kanchipuram or were not able to breach the fortress of kanchipuram by and uh, the pallavas had retreated within the walls of kanchipuram so the pallavas did not fight in the first place and uh, they retreated into Kanchipuram and Pulakesi followed them right up to Kanchipuram, but uh, most probably was not able to break into Kanchipuram. So that probably made uh, now uh, Pulakesi quite unhappy, given that uh, he is a great warrior and till such time he has all uh, he had uh, uh, he had uh, almost won all the battles. So he was not able to you know probably digest the fact that he was not able to break into uh, Pallava's capital. So an enraged Pulakesi then marched his way to south. He went from uh, Kanjipuram deep into the south, the southern territories. We do not know how far he penetrated into the south. The Ihole inscription states that uh, the Chera, Chola and the Pandya king submitted to him and he accepted their submission. Now, the Chola king and the Cholas were probably under the Pallava Pallavas at that point in time. So he could have gone, marched his army right up to Kaveri, which was a part of the Chola kingdom. And we do not about uh, we do not know about the Cheras. Probably he did not enter the core Chara kingdom of Kerala. Instead, he would have engaged the Kongunadu branch uh, branch of the Cheras, the Kongunadu uh, branch of Cholas who are ruling from Karur near Trichy. So probably when he attacked uh, or when he uh, when he marched his way to the Kaveri, he would have come across uh, uh, the Chara uh, branch line of uh, Kongunadu who would have submitted to him. As far as Pandyas are concerned, we do not know if he went right up to Madurai or beyond Madurai. And in our probability, maybe he went into the northern territory, as, uh, northern territory of Pandyas and uh, somewhere around Thirumayam, which was probably ruled by uh, a vassal of the Pandya king. We do not know. We do not have any uh, record confirming that. As Thirumayam is said to be uh, the northern uh, fringes of the Pandya territory and very close to Trichirapalli. So maybe he marched his army up to Thirumayam and maybe the vassals of the uh, Pandya submitted to him. It was not the uh, Pandya king himself, but uh, one of the vassals of Pandya that submitted to him. So all this happened uh, sometime in 621, but his main objective of breaching Kanchipuram did not happen. So probably uh, after uh, accepting the uh, submission of uh, the southern kings, he marched his way back to Kanchipuram. Now, there are two inscriptions that talk about this uh, battle. One is the inscription of uh, uh, Pulakesi, the Iola inscription, which states that the Pallava king was uh, afraid of his power. Uh, was afraid of his power. This is a breathing of some Can you just mute your. Uh, Brothers, can you please uh, mute yourself? Sorry. Okay. Uh, so there are uh, there are two inscriptions that talk about uh, this uh, invasion of Pulakesi, uh, invasion of uh, the Pallava territory by Pulakesi. The first one is his Ayahuala inscription, in which he says that the Pallavas were scared of his uh, rice, and uh, so he had to invade uh, their territory and he confined them within the walls of Kanjipuram, which clearly states that he could not breach the fort of Kanjipuram. He could not enter. The city of Kanchi, which was probably his objective, and that did not happen. There was another inscription, interestingly, of Mahendra Varma. Mahendra Pallavan, in his inscription, the Kasakodi inscription, he states that uh, he fought a battle against a king, and he had named he had not named that king, an unnamed king, and he came out victorious. Now we do not know who that unknown unnamed king was, even though some of the scholars identified that king as Palakesi. If Pulakesi had been that king, we are not. Uh, we do not know why uh, Mahendra Pallava was uh, shy of, uh, you know, mentioning his name in that inscription. But this particular battle, this particular inscription, inscription uh, talks about a battle around the same period uh, when uh, Pulakesi entered uh, the Pallava territory. So probably, according to some of the uh, scholars or some of the historians, uh, Mahendra Pallava's reference was only to Pulakesi. Now, when did this battle of Pullalur happen? He talks about a battle, uh, Mahendra Pallava talks about a battle in Pullalur, where he, uh, where he said uh, that he defeated an unnamed king. 
So when did this Pulanur battle happen? According to some scholars, again, this happened initially when Pulakesi entered the Pallava territory. And then uh, Mahendra Pallava, after inflicting damage on Pulakesi's army, retreated uh, within the walls of Kanchipuram. And according to some other scholars, it happened when Pulakesi returned from south after accepting the submission of the southern kings. Now we are not sure as to when exactly this battle happened. But in my opinion, if this Pularu battle had happened in the initial stage, I don't think uh, Pulakesi would have taken a risk of invading the southern territories after uh, Mahendra Pallava had inflicted damages on his army. Once you inflicted damages on me, the normal instinct is to return and turn back to the safety of his kingdom and not move further to attack the southern parts, which is again deep inside the Pallava territory. And there was always a chance of Pallava encircling them on all sides and retaliate. So I don't think this particular battle happened, battle happened during the initial stages. Probably after accepting the submission of the southern kings, when, uh, by, uh, when Pulakesi marched his army back uh, to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, to the vicinity of the Pallava kingdom, he made another attempt to breach Kanjipuram. Maybe pro probably, it is not actually, uh, it's just an assumption. He probably made uh, an attempt to breach the walls of Kanjipuram because that was his objective. And when he tried to do that, the Pallavas who had retreated earlier might have regrouped and in engaged the Chalukyas in a battle at Pullalur and inflicted some kind of damage on the Chalukyas, making them retreat back into their territory and thereby saving their capital. So this is probably uh, is my uh, view because uh, uh, taking the uh, uh, various events that happened uh, during the battle into consideration. So by 621, it was a uh, Pulakesi had invaded the Pallava territory. It was a mixed result for Pulakesi, even though he was able to, uh, you know, uh, get the submission of the southern kings according to his Iole inscription. Even though he was able to make the Pallavas retreat uh, within the walls of Kanjipuram. The objective of uh, entering Kanjipuram was not actually uh, achieved. And uh, why uh, he was so particular about entering Kanjipuram? If you look at the history of Kanjipuram, Kanjipuram was probably the most, you can say, uh, sacred town or the historical town in South India. It, uh, it was almost a revered town uh, on par with Kasi. They used to call it Nagareshu Kanji. And uh, it was not only uh, a place, so it's not only a capital, unlike Tanjavur, it was also a place of, uh, it, was a, it was a center of knowledge and a center of religion, because nowhere in India you can see uh, specific dominions of, uh, dominions uh, inhabited by a particular religion. When it comes to Kanchi, the Kanchi was divided into four parts. Vishnu Kanchi of the Vaishnavites, Shiva Kanchi of the Saivites, Bauda Kanchi of uh, Buddhists, and Jaina Kanchi of the Jains. So Kanchi was not only just a capital, it was a sacred town, it was a religious center, it was a learning center, it was a knowledge hub, and it was uh, considered on par with uh, Kashi when it comes to knowledge. As I said, they call it Nagareshu Kanchi, the uh, Kanchi, the best town. So maybe Pulakesi's attempt was to breach Kanchi so that he can, uh, you know, occupy Kanchi, and that would have really been uh, the icing uh, on the cake for this uh, young ruler, but that did not happen. So Purakesi maybe was uh, con uh, may have probably considered this particular invasion uh, as uh, you can say uh, with uh, as a mixed result. Uh, he was able to inflict damage. He was able to make the Pallavas uh, retreat, but still he could not occupy uh, the uh, uh, occupy the capital Kanchipuram. And as far as the Pallavas are concerned, yes, they retreated first within the walls of Kanjipuram, but probably they offered a fight at a later stage and they were able to push uh, Pulakesi and his army back into their territory. But unfortunately for Mahendra Pallava, he lost the northern territories to the Chalukyas. The Chalukyas occupied uh, some parts of northern Tamil Nadu beyond Pala and also the southern part of Andhra Pradesh. So, so Mahendra Pallan was able to save his capital, but he probably lost the northern parts of his territories to Pulakesi. So it was a mixed result. It was quite indecisive and uh, 
and all the uh, in, and inconclusive uh, the chalukyas had their day and so did the palavas so this happened in 621 and by 621 pulakesi was back in his capital so so this is uh, what we had just discovered uh, what we had just discussed discuss. the ayola inscription clearly states that uh, he uh, reduced uh, the power of pallavas to dust and uh, made them vanish behind the walls of kanjipura whereas the punalur ins uh, the inscription of uh, mahendra pallava clearly states that he annihilated uh, the uh, enemy uh, and uh, made them retreat so it's we can say that uh, it was a mixed bag for both the uh, chalukyas and the pallavas so by 621 this is how the kingdom of or the empire of uh, Pulakesi looked like a real empire an empire in real terms and every brick every piece of land was built by Pulakesi I keep repeating because in Indian history you always see uh, the kings developing a kingdom and handing over the kingdom to his sons who take it to the next level you take any uh, kingdom for that matter even in Cholas it was Rajaraja Chola who developed the kingdom and uh, handed over a powerful and a wealthy kingdom to Rajendra Chola who developed it into an empire. But for Pulakesi, he had to start from the scratch. He did not own even a single piece of land in 609 when he was uh, in exile. And in just say about uh, 621 means around 10 to 12 years, he had built a huge empire stretching from the uh, Narmada Valley in the north to the uh, southern part of Karnataka, the Kaveri, the flow of Kaveri in Karnataka, and from the western coast, the Konkan Goa coast in the west, to the eastern coast of uh, Andhra Pradesh. And so his empire expanded, and a true empire was born. A true empire was born. And uh, look at the present uh, states that were covered by Polakesi's kingdom. A piece of Gujarat, a piece of Madhya Pradesh, then a piece of Chhattisgarh, then the southern part of uh, Orissa, the whole of Andhra Pradesh, the whole of Telangana, then the whole of Karnataka, Goa, and parts of Madhya Pradesh and uh, parts of Maharashtra. So a kingdom that spanned across at least 10 to 11 current Indian states. Just imagine, all the states are quite huge. Telangana and Andhra, they were the the undivided Andhra Pradesh was a huge state after before it was uh, cut into Telangana and uh, Andhra. Maharashtra was a huge state, Karnataka was a huge state, and all these states were completely under his control. It stretched across the entire Deccan Plateau from one end to another. So this is how the kingdom looked like in 621, and this is actually uh, the first, you can say, the first empire of South India, and thus born the first emperor of South India. Imadi Pulikesi the second. So and he built this empire again to repeat in a matter of just 10 to 12 years. And he had the stature to fight a battle with a powerful Pallava, Mahendra Pallava, and also with a powerful Vardhana to the north in the north, the Harshavardhana. And the next 20 years of Pulikesi was quite peaceful, very peaceful, in fact. There were no battles, he was firmly in control of the whole uh, uh, empire, the empire which we had just seen. And uh, basically, Pulikesi was a very, very shrewd guy. He knew that it is not possible uh, for him to control such a huge empire sitting in uh, Watapi. So he, what he did was, he, whenever he uh, defeated a king, he handed over the king back to him and made him his vassal. And in some cases where he sensed trouble from that king, he actually uh, made another king uh, in charge of... Uh, this kingdom, like what, uh, how he did, uh, how he made the Alupas uh, control uh, Kadambas. Alupas were basically vassals to the Kadambas. Later, they started controlling Kadambas so that Alupas also got some kind of uh, you know importance, and they also ensured that uh, Kadambas were just pushed out. So that's a kind of you know uh, you know uh, the intelligence this uh, young lad had in 621, and he was probably, as I said, maybe in his mid 30s when. Uh, all this uh, conquest happened. And by 624, he had trifurcated the kingdom into three. What did he do? He simply hived off 
the northern part of kingdom to his uh, cousin a distant cousin called vijayavarma he made him the governor of the natar or the, uh, the narmada valley and vishnuvardhana who he had already made him the uh, crown prince and his successor yuvaraja he sent vishnuvardhana as the governor of the east coast of andhra pradesh that included the parts of kalinga vengi and uh, vishnu kundanis and also the newly acquired regions from pallavas so he just trifurcated the kingdom vishnu vijayavarma uh, vijayavarma was sent to uh, the latha chalukyan territory vishnu vardhana was sent to the uh, what do you call as the coastal andhra pradesh and these two kings were uh, these two were made governors not the kings uh, and uh, there was uh, some kind of autonomy they were uh, given free hand to reorganize their kingdoms and rule according to their whims and fancies so pulake and uh, with uh, with the uh, with the vassals actually uh, uh, ruling over the uh, the konkan and the coastal region of karnataka and uh, maharashtra and the gangas who had marital relationship ruling over uh, the southern part of karnataka to some extent pulake he was uh, you know the burden of administration uh, on pulake he had listened to a large extent and uh, by 641 you can say 40 41 what he did was he gave independence to vijayavarma and vishnuvardhana so he said okay for guys now you are no longer governors you are the kings of your respective regions this is where pulakesi uh, showed a lot of intelligence showed of uh, you know can say uh, uh, a lot of had a lot of had a foresight because he did not want a repeat of what had happened to him earlier when his uncle occupied the throne and refused to seat control or seat the throne to him after his father's death so he did not want his brothers vishnuvardhana or his uh, distant relative vijayava uh, vijayavarma to come uh, in the way of his sons occupying the chalukyan throne so he said guys from now onwards you are independent so you are now your own uh, yeah, you have your own kingdom and you rule as per your whims and fancies and by 641 if you look at the inscriptions of uh, vishnuvardhana and uh, vijayavarma the name of pulakesi was missing till such time there was a salutation to pulakesi to begin with which was done away with from 641 so probably somewhere between 640 and 641 the uh, northern part of the chalukyan territory and the eastern part of the chalukyan territory were hived off into independent kingdoms but these two branch lines of uh, chalukyas actually had very very close social cultural and marital relationship with the mainland chalukyas so those the successors of uh, vijayavarma in the latha region came to be called as latha chalukyas and the descendants of vishnuvardhana in the coastal region of andhra pradesh came to be called as the eastern chalukyas so vishnuvardhana established the eastern chalukyan dynasty while vijayavarma established the latha chalukyan dynasty dynasties had very close contacts with the main chalukyan dynasty and uh, so finally in 641 when we come to the closure of pulakesi's uh, uh, what you can say uh, reign uh, as i mentioned before wang zong the chinese traveler visited uh, pulakesi's uh, court he called him pulakeshin and uh, and he had a lot of good words to talk about pulakesi he calls pulakesi a great warrior one who led from the front in all the battles and a compulsive warrior and uh, he was loved by his citizens he said very benevolent and uh, kind to his citizens who loved him a lot and he had an army a large army of um, infantry cavalry and thousands of elephants and uh, he also talks about uh, uh, prakashin's uh, victory over ashwardhana and he had a lot of good things to say and he says that the soldiers were very loyal to prakashin Uh, so loyal that uh, they preferred death to disloyalty and uh, he also says that uh, generals who lose the battles were not punished but were made to wear uh, uh, a women's uh, outfit and uh, thus uh, humiliated and uh, the citizens of uh, and we can say the uh, people of uh, pulakesin's country were quite tall quite sturdy well built and uh, slightly darker in complexion and uh, also he says that uh, they used to engage others in duel whenever uh, someone speaks uh, bad about uh, that person or his family so 
he says that they were they were very uh, kind of you know people who retaliate. So there are a lot of good words. So I'm wrong. I had a lot of good words to talk about to say about Polakasin. And Polakasin is credited uh, and is said to uh, be the first emperor or first king in South India to issue gold coins. And uh, yeah, that hap that probably happened very very early in his uh, reign. So these are for 21 years, as Swan Zong mentioned in his uh, travelogue, that he ruled 30 years without uh, a battle. So he ruled for 20 years. Now comes, uh, now we uh, get closer to the uh, end of Apalakesi's reign. So by 630, Mahendra Pallava had passed away and the reigns passed on to his son, Narsima Pallava. Narsima Pallava is also called as Mamalla or Malla, which means the great wrestler. Uh, he was an expert in uh, wrestling. So between 630 and 641, Narasimha Pallava was basically, uh, you know, concentrating on building his kingdom and also building a large army so that he can ward off uh, uh, the threat of Pulakesi. And uh, obviously looking at his uh, history, he was not very much interested in invading the Chalukyan territory first because if he wanted to, he would have done that anytime between 630 and 641. But he did not do that. He was probably waiting for Pulakesi to make the first move. And Pulakesi obliged him. He just did what Maya Narasimha Varman wanted him to do by invading the Chalukyan territory in 642. We do not know the reasons for this invasion, but probably the Banas, who were basically ruling over the southern part of southeast, southeast part of Karnataka and northern part of Tamil Nadu, had uh, uh, warmed up to uh, the Pallavas and were getting very closer to the Pallavas. And so he thought uh, that could uh, be a threat to his kingdom or to his empire. And uh, pro the other reason was probably he was not happy with the uh, outcome of the first battle in 621 because he could not breach Kanjipuram. So maybe a combination of reason forced him to enter the Kanjipuram territory again. And he came uh, marching across his southern territories right into Pallava territory. But this time Narasimha Pallava was quite prepared. He knew uh, what needs to be done. So he basically allowed uh, Pulakesi to move well into his territory, to the vicinity of his capital, very near to his capital. And he surrounded the uh, Chalukyan army on three sides and attacked. In fact, battles took place at three different places. And in all the three battles, Pulakesi was defeated. Probably Pulakesi did not expect this, or he was just taken aback by the uh, force of the Pallavas. And the final battle took place in a place called the Manimangalam, which is currently on the southern suburbs of, uh, or the southwest suburbs of uh, Chennai. And uh, in the battle of Manimangalam, Pulakesi lost and made a hasty retreat back into his territory. And now that Pallavas had tasted blood, they pursued the Watabi, uh, the Chalukyas, right into the heart of the territory and pursued them to such an extent that one fine morning they landed on the landed at the gates of Watapi, 700 kilometers. The Pallavas pursued Chalukyas right up to Watapi. And in a battle that happened just outside, uh, somewhere uh, just outside Watapi, Pulakesin was killed. The great warrior who built the first empire of the south died fighting with the Pallavas. And now with the gates of Watapi open, the powerful uh, and the large Pallava army entered Watapi. Then it was all a mayhem. The Watapi was attacked, destroyed, plundered, looted, set on fire, and burned to ashes. Watapi became a ghost town, and they just uh, ensured that nothing remained of Watapi. So, thus, Narasimha Pallava extracted revenge for Pulakesi's invasion of Kanjipuram and went one step ahead by destroying Kanjipuram. Pulakesi could not enter Kanjipuram, whereas Narasimha Pallava not only reached Watabi, but also entered Kanjipuram and then defeated the Vishnu Kundinis, uh, defeated the Chalukyas, sorry for that. So now Pulakesi died fighting. The entire kingdom was plunged into chaos. There was no one to lead the fight. We do not know where the sons of Pulakesi were. Pulakesi had five sons, which we'll discuss later. So the entire kingdom was plunged into darkness. The entire kingdom was basically, you know, uh, 
headless there were chaos everywhere the capital was lost and not only the capital but the southern territories of uh, chalukyas uh, were occupied by the advancing pallava forces so the pallavas occupied not only uh, right from the southern uh, territory of the chalukyas right up to watapi so that was a disastrous uh, campaign or disastrous uh, result for uh, the great warrior kolakesi in the second who died and when he died he was probably in his late 50s common 50s on 58 years old uh, when he died so uh, what did rasima uh, pallava do he is said to have constructed a temple uh, the manikarjuna swami temple right in the heart of watapi and uh, he also planted he to have planted a uh, pillar victory pillar at the bottom of the pillar on this side actually there is a small image of a seated lion the seated lion uh, was the uh, royal emblem of the pallavas and uh, you can and we can see that in the coins issued by nasa pallava very similar to that it was not exactly the seated lion of the coin uh, that was that the coin but a seated lion nevertheless uh, who, which was the uh, royal emblem of the pallavas and he did not stop at that what he did was just behind the uh, manikarjuna swami temple there was a huge boulder and there he engraved his famous pallava sasana this pallava sasana is dated the 13th regnal year of narasimha pallava which is 642 and written in pallava granth a mixture of uh, tamil and uh, adi and uh, what does he say here he just says that he has conquered watapi he has assumed the title watapi kondan or the conqueror of watapi thereby becoming the emperor of the chalukyan territory in addition to the pallava territory which he was already holding so the disgrace the humiliation was complete for the chalukyas in every possible way not only they lost watapi not only they lost the southern territories but also uh, the pallava king engraved his inscription right in the heart of their capital now according to some uh, scholars it was mahendra pallava who led this uh, invasion of watapi assisted by his uh, trusted general paranjodi and according to some uh, other scholars uh, he said it's just paranjodi who led the invasion into the watapi kingdom and narasimha pallava initially involved in the battle and once the pallava uh, once the Ch <coughs> chalukya started retreating it was the pallava uh, it was the pallavas led by paranjodi who actually pursued him so whatever may be the case whether it was narasimha pallava or paranjodi because paranjodi played a very large part in this battle it was paranjodi who was a brave warrior and one of the 69 iron master at a later date uh, who led the offensive into the uh, chalukya territory and went right out to watapi so with this uh, came the end of uh, polakesi's reign and uh, the darkness engulfed uh, or enveloped the entire kingdom of uh, polakesi and uh, the empire was in total shambles what you see on the screen is polakesi's court uh, as depicted in a uh, painting in the first cave number 1 of ajanta i have this picture but again uh, it's uh, it's not clear uh, because of the passage of time and on the right you can see uh, the artist's impression of how it was with polakesi sitting and uh, a persian ambassador probably uh, talking to him uh, he is here and this is polakesi occupying the throne and uh, for a guy uh, for a person who was uh, you know uh, who built a, a huge empire starting from the scratch and a very wealthy and a prosperous empire just look at his uh, outfit he has just a simple crown a couple of necklaces and just a loin cloth he doesn't even have uh, you know a full fledged uh, you can say outfit so maybe probably was that simple and uh, that simple guy and who not only uh, you know clearly divided his life into uh, phases thereby in taking uh, his uh, dynasty uh, to the peak before it uh, collapsed so now we come to uh, uh, the last to see the last uh, slide of today now what happened in the next 12 years we do not know the history is not clear so we do not have uh, the real uh, idea of how long the pallavas occupied uh, watapi according to some scholars they occupied watapi for 14 or 13 years and uh, we do not know if uh, narasimha pallava was that uh, naive to occupy a ghost town for 13 years a town which has already been plundered and uh, looted and uh, reduced to ashes we do not know 
Then what was the status of Chalukya kingdom after Palakasin's death? It was in shambles. We do not know how bad it was, but it was in total chaos. It was a total chaos and shambles. And what were Pulikesi's five sons doing during that period? Again, we do not know. Were they fighting among themselves for a piece of land, a piece of the territory? Where were they when Watabi was conquered? Again, then when did the Pallavas recover or when did the Pallavas uh, withdraw from the territories? When did the Chalukyas recover the lost territories? Again, that was another question. And the final question is, how did the Chalukyas recover from this deadly blow when they lost their capital and their king? So based on all this, uh, questions there were there was a healthy debate going on and again scholars have come to their own conclusions and we will try to answer these questions in tomorrow's sessions with very interesting artifacts and very interesting details and some logical arguments and we'll see how the Chalukya has recovered from this deadly blow and again become a kingdom or become an empire at a later date so Thank you for your patience. That brings us to the end of this session. And uh, we'll meet again tomorrow. Thank you. Back to you, Anand. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, an excellent session. Uh, yeah, so let's take up the questions tomorrow. Uh, hello, friends. Uh, thank you for all your patience. I think uh, it was a, a, a virtual uh, tour. That's what Ramesh has done. We all went back. and. Uh, keep the momentum and uh, there's a lot more stories coming up tomorrow as well so let's uh, join at 5 30 tomorrow and then um, you know finish the session okay thank you so much have a wonderful evening and a weekend good night to you all thank, thank you. you thank you all